Welcome, everybody. I want to welcome everyone from the Center for African and African American Studies at Rice University. We're really excited to welcome Alicia Odewale to talk about her active archaeological research in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The talk is co-sponsored tonight by the Task Force on Slavery, Segregation, and Racial Injustice, and BRIDGE, which is a group of faculty and students at Rice that seeks to enrich our understandings of inequality. I'm going to first introduce Dr. Odewale, and then Dr. Daniel Dominguez will come on after a talk and manage the question and answer session. So if you have any questions during the talk, please put them in the Q&A feature on Zoom. So Dr. Odewale is an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Tulsa. She's an incredibly active and vibrant scholar. One strand of her research focuses on the historical archeology span of enslaved Africans in the continental US and the US Virgin Islands, specifically focusing in St. Croix. This work has been broadly comparative and looks at the difference between urban and rural settings, but also compares the experiences and responses between enslaved people in the US and St. Croix. In St. Croix, she's the co-director of an amazing field school called the Estate Little Princess Archaeological Field School. This is a research program that trains local students in archaeological methods and other STEM-related skills while conducting important archaeological research on the island. Today, Dr. Odawale is going to be presenting on another important project that she directs in Tulsa, Oklahoma. This project has launched new archaeological investigations in the historic Greenwood District, the site of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. Like her work in St. Croix, this work is founded on a community-based approach and involves a remarkable set of city, community, and scholarly stakeholders. Dr. Odewale has published a number of important articles and is the recipient of numerous grants and awards. Her talk tonight is entitled Restorative Justice Archaeology, Unearthing the Aftermath of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Odewale. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff, for that warm, warm introduction. Thank you to Rice and to Cass and uh, all the rest of our sponsors for inviting me to speak. And I'm going to start sharing my screen now. Okay, so to start us off, I wanted to first acknowledge that today's a really tough day for Black women around the world as uh, the trial and decision for Breonna Taylor we're still reeling from, but just the idea of this time period that we're in of social injustice, these conversations are so vital. So I'm so thankful that uh, Cass and the rest of uh, the team at Rice is putting on these the series of lectures to focus on restorative justice issues and uh, really issues around race around the world. So thank you for having me. The first thing I wanted to kind of put out there as a caveat is that I'm presenting today the initial stages of research that we're doing in Tulsa. So a lot of the slides I'm gonna share with you are subject to change and will change as we're unfolding this project. And two, that I will not be talking about the mass grave search today. I know a lot of people have been really uh, excited about that work and that work is vital, but that's not the uh, crux of the work that I do in Tulsa. And uh, third, that just like the title of the presentation says, my focus is on the aftermath of the massacre and not the massacre itself, but how the community is actually recovering and surviving past that point. Uh, and then I also wanted to share that I will be sharing some historical photos, but there will be no images of uh, bodies or ancestral remains being shown on the screen out of respect for the descendants. And the first thing that I will be sharing today if you can join me in a moment of reflection, I'm gonna share a testimony from a survivor in their own words. So if you all could uh, just wherever you are as you're in your homes or at work, uh, just listen while I read. One of the most horrible scenes of race hatred and mob violence that history has ever recorded on the face of the globe occurred at Tulsa, Oklahoma on the night of Tuesday, May 31st and morning of Wednesday, June 1st, 1921. All night long, they could be heard firing from both sides as the whites gathered more than 5,000 men 
to make an early attack on the Negro section in the morning. At the signal of the whistle, more than a dozen airplanes went up and began to drop turpentine balls upon the Negro residences, while the 5,000 whites with machine guns and other deadly weapons began firing in all directions. Negro men, women, and children were killed in great numbers as they ran, trying to flee to safety. Several were tied to the backs of automobiles and dragged through the streets while bullets were being fired into their bodies. As the fighting progressed, men were captured and taken to the town hall. Women and children were taken to different parts of the city. After they had cleared more than 500 homes, then the dirty work of firing and looting of homes began. Torch lights were used with gasoline to burn up the Negro settlement. And in the meantime, they used large trucks loading up pianos, victrolas, dishes, furs, and other articles that were in the Negro homes. Greenwood Street, the Negro's Broadway of Tulsa, and one of the best Negro business streets in the whole USA now lies a heap of ashes. The number of whites and Negroes killed in this raid will never be known. Reverend Augustus Hicks, pastor of the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Sand Springs. And this work was published in, I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. This work was published in the first account that was a published account by uh, Mary Jones Parrish, The Events of the Tulsa Disaster. His account is within that, and that was published back in 1923. So you can actually get a copy of the book today, but it's pretty expensive because it's, it is considered a historical text. So as I read this important testimony from Reverend Hicks, a lot of imagery might be coming to your minds. But one of the most common images that people usually think about when they hear about the Tulsa Race Massacre are images of buildings and uh, homes on fire, this famous image of the Dreamland Theater in ruins, and the central image in the middle, this is the most shared image across multiple collections that actually has the words running the Negro out of Tulsa etched onto the photo itself. And that's part of the original photograph. <clears throat> but what we're talking about here today is everything that happened after this part of the story. And the idea of uh, trying to get a handle on what the actual neighborhood of Greenwood was and get a fuller story, we have to talk about both before and after. And so before the massacre, the idea of Greenwood is kind of wrapped up in the idea of Black affluence, Black excellence, to say that everyone was driving automobiles like this, living in uh, fancy houses or uh, running large hotels, and everyone's a capital of industry. But that's only part of the story, yet again. So we have people that are living like this, and that, that dynamic certainly exists. But then we also have people like Emma Buckner, who are, who's running a sewing shop. This is before the massacre. She's running the sewing shop by herself, she has some people, her employees under her, but this is giving us an idea that there are people of all, men and women, of different trades being represented here in Greenwood, and that there are different people of social economic standing. What makes Greenwood so powerful is not that everyone was wealthy, but that this was a safe haven from racial prejudice. This is a oasis in the middle of the Jim Crow South. So this is uh, something that is important, and this is where the name Black Wall Street even came from. It's not that everyone was affluent, but everyone could determine their own destiny. And if we think about the aftermath of Greenwood, this is where really no one has an image in their mind when they think about the aftermath of the Tulsa Race Massacre, because this is part of the story that's been ignored the most. And when we think about how the community actually came about putting the pieces of their lives back together after 9,000 to 10,000 people are now homeless. The survivors are now homeless. Uh, they are coming together, and this is an ongoing story of resilience as the community is building that Greenwood themselves. So people don't really talk about how Greenwood was rebuilt. They only talk about how it was destroyed. So it starts in stages where people are living in tents actually through the winter of 1921 and then uh, wood slant houses, and then they're shifting to start building back businesses. And so this uh, on the right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, 
But on the right here, there's a, a building that was rebuilt after the massacre that houses a barber shop, a pool hall, a cafe, and a shoe shine parlor all together because the community is literally coalescing to survive. And in the middle here, you can see famous image of BC Franklin. After his own law practice was destroyed, he's uh, basically holding his uh, appointments out of this tent, preparing his legal arguments out of this tent to help the community fight insurance claims and fight this city's effort to rezone this entire district to be a business district to prevent people from rebuilding. So there's a lot of grassroots community development that's happening just because the people who, the reason why Greenwood stands today is because of the survivors who stood together and rebuilt this space. But then it was redestroyed again in the process of urban renewal in the 1960s and 70s, but that's a whole nother story. So as we are kicking off this project, the first thing we did was start a community meeting. And in this process of pulling together a lot of community members to talk about this, we asked them a lot of questions. One of the questions we asked was, what, what aspects of Greenwood do you think get overlooked the most? What do you think are the aspects of Greenwood that people should focus less on? And other questions that came to the forefront, the, the ones that rose to the top were questions that some of them we might never know, but it's still worth asking. Like if the attack was premeditated or orchestrated by the city and somehow, if the, if the city was actually complicit in the attack. And if we can ever put more evidence to the fact that Greenwood was the first city to be bombed from the air, or that the National Guard actually used machine guns on American citizens. But there were questions that were, that archeology span actually speak to, like, where victims might be buried, or what part of Greenwood possibly survived that burning and survived urban renewal and these cycles of violence that's been done to the community? And what, what, uh, what can we do to prove some connections between the past challenges that Greenwood faced and the present day challenges that Greenwood is facing right now? So there's, there's a lot that we can do with archeology span that we are now pulling from these community questions to see what, what things can archaeology lend itself to. And that led us to this idea of restorative justice archaeology. And so this whole idea comes from uh, Colwell, uh, Chip Colwell Chantapone. He championed this way back in 2007 when he was developing his Fort Apache project in the Southwest. And the best thing that came out of this was this model of restorative justice archaeology that broke down between retributive and restorative justice. And retributive justice is different from restorative in that it's focused on assigning blame, assigning punishment, the who, what, when, where, why, while restorative justice is focused on healing, healing from trauma and healing as a community. Uh, and so in trying to find out where your project is seated in terms of retributive or restorative justice, he then broke it down into a model of uh, what, what common elements do all restorative justice projects serve? And multivocal was the first one, the first element that's common, and that all these truths can coexist together. So multiple narratives can coexist, and this is where different forms of, different ways of knowing can come to the forefront. So your oral, your uh, your photographic evidence, your written history can all be part of the ways of knowing about this event. And also it's giving us an idea of there's no privileged position of truth. There can be multiple perspectives, multiple truths here. And dialogical is another feature in that this is not a one way sort of conversation. You're not going in and teaching someone about their history, but it is a two way street, it is a dialogue. And you are dialoguing, acknowledging that there could be decades of knowledge that's already been generated by survivors before you got there. And deeply historical, meaning that we're examining change through time, but we're also really invested in connecting the deep past to its political present. And informal, meaning that there's no governing force, there's no government involvement, there's no coercive body sort of controlling the narrative, controlling the interpretation of the space or the events. This is a, and again, an exchange 
where everyone's on the same playing field, there is no hierarchy. But applying that model that Chip developed back in 2007 to Tulsa today, I've added a few more criteria that I think every restorative justice archaeology project needs. Uh, and this is coming out of this new development of anti-racist archaeology practice and uh, Black feminist practice, Indigenous archaeology, as well as queer studies, that we have a lot more to, a lot more responsibility in this era to bring social justice to the area of archaeology. So the first common element should be that it's layered and that you're not just focused on one aspect of healing, that the understanding should be layered and interdisciplinary to the point that whenever you are trying to develop a project, you're not doing it in a vacuum to where you have the idea that uh, it should be part of your work to extend what archaeology can do, meaning the return of cultural remains, the, the return of cultural objects, land, and uh, monetary uh, financial loss. So there should be a lot more to your uh, applied focus in restorative justice archaeology. So that, that's what makes it a layered project. And then community-based, meaning that it's not just a public engagement or public archaeology project, but it's driven by the community. And you're acknowledging that the community is not speaking with one voice. It's not a monolith. So you as the researcher have this added uh, responsibility to find out who, what makes up your community, who are the groups being represented here, what are their needs, and what can archaeology do to possibly help some of those needs. You won't be able to <laughs> please everybody, but having the responsibility to uh, do some extra research, some extra labor to find out who's there, who's being represented, who's speaking, and who's not being included. And so the last thing that I wanted to share about this is that restorative justice archaeology projects should be visionary and that they are future focused and you are able to imagine what a healed community looks like and work towards that actively. So that's a lot to try and put on one archaeology project, but that's why you can't do this work in a vacuum. Visionary restorative justice archaeology projects have to be done with other groups, with other stakeholders, with other community members, so that whatever projects that you develop can be extended based on the way that other people are using those materials. So you're thinking about the next generation, you're thinking about visualizing trauma in new ways and taking old evidence and bringing new meaning from that. All of that is visionary labor that has, has to be part of this process. And so when we're looking at the archeology span unfolding in Greenwood right now, there's two main projects, the Mapping Historical Trauma in Tulsa project, and then the City of Tulsa's Mass Grave Survey. The main difference here is that the mapping project is restorative, while the City of Tulsa Mass Graves project is more retributive because it's been treated as a homicide investigation. They're more interested in the who, what, where, why, and uh, in, a, in a homicide format versus the restorative justice project that uh, the, the mapping historical trauma project that has all the things that we were just talking about. But the mass grave survey is the one everyone's been hearing about in the media. But if you actually look back to those categories I just shared with you, the mapping project is designed to be historical, dialogical, multivocal, informal, layer, community-based, and visionary. So in thinking about the, the full uh, project scope, the, it's directed by myself and my colleague, Dr. Parker Van Volkenberg out of Brown University. And it's designed to be a four-year project. So we just got started last year and we're funded by the Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. And they are a group of descendants, educators, uh, civil servants, activists, cultural leaders that are all either from the Greenwood District or uh, live in North Tulsa region or are actively involved and work in that space. So what makes this project significant is that this is the first time we've had a systematic archeological investigation of the historic Greenwood district. Up until this point, there have been surveys in different areas around the city, but not a systematic approach to search for signs of life in Greenwood. 
And when we're thinking about this project and how it's developing, it's part of this new move for auto archaeology. This is an archaeology of self. So this is part of this new class of scholarship where archaeologists are going in and investigating both as an archaeologist, but also as a, as a descendant or as a member of the community. And they're investigating spaces in their own home, familiar space. So here we have a project that's developed by Tulsans and for the Tulsa community. So this is a grassroots effort. So we are both led and funded from within the Tulsa community. So the way that this project unfolded was different than traditional archaeology projects because we didn't approach the community with uh, our permits and a site in place and all our funding in order and then approach this community with a finished plan. But when the commission asked us what an archaeology project in Greenwood could look like, all we had was an idea and a budget. And then they worked with us to help us understand what would be the most uh, beneficial for present day residents in North Tulsa and how can we align our project with the other ones that are going on right now in Greenwood as we're heading into the centennial 2021. So the community represents our stakeholders, they're our fundraisers, but they're also our governing body. And just to put a picture of the two of us together, <laughs> well, the main question we get is how did you all even come together? <laughs> how did this happen? And we are both born and raised in Tulsa. We actually went to the same high school, but just at different times. And this was the first time we've had the opportunity to come home and do archaeology in our own city. And we both uh, sort of went to school learning this kind of shallow history of the massacre. But we were always wanting to do some archaeology in Greenwood. But this was the first time we actually got a chance to do it. So. As we're developing this project, I mentioned that it's a four-year project, but we're pulling together digital mapping, re-examining some archival sources, a new collaborative archaeological investigation, and then some digital resources that we're building for the community. And all of this has an ongoing theme of restorative justice. And so our first goal with this project was just to document all the collections that exist related to Tulsa race massacre history. And you would think that wouldn't be a lot, but <laughs> what we've come to find out is that this, uh, the information about the massacre and Greenwood itself is so scattered that it's a huge step just to document where all these collections are. So we call that the Greenwood Centennial Resource Collection. And that's kind of a, uh, a deliverable for the community in itself as a first step. And then our second goal was to map the footprint of historic Greenwood of the historic Greenwood business district. And I mentioned that because the, the business district itself is separate from the rest of the uh, Greenwood space where housing is actually happening more, but the business district has its own kind of centralized space. So trying to map that footprint for 100 years is one of the biggest parts of this project. Because from 1921 to 2021, the footprint of Greenwood is shrinking through time. And the way to visualize that for new audiences is through this Greenwood Historical Web GIS that we're building. And so all of those uh, documents, maps, photograph photographic evidence that we're putting in that resource collection can then be used to be embedded into this Web GIS map that will be an online map interface for, uh, for free for people to use in uh, interact with that primary data. And then as we're moving on to the archaeological portion of this project, where we're focused on surveys and excavations, the focus is finding signs of life. And so we, instead of focusing on looking for uh, graves or ancestral remains, which is incredibly important work to do, we need the other side of the story. How did people live in Greenwood? And did anything survive this uh, massive burning event? Did anything survive the urban renewal event? So these signs of structural survival are what we're gonna be looking for. And as we're looking for that, we wanna develop what's called new critical sites of memory. And why this is so important is that the, uh, the problem now is that we have a lot of different narratives about Greenwood out there and about the massacre out there. And it shifts depending on who's telling the story. 
But when you have critical sites of memory, you can anchor the story with specific places, specific uh, time stamps, specific uh, spaces that have a real role in telling the story that cannot be co-opted because now they're fixed for a specific point, a specific place in time. And as we're thinking about the future, the visionary part of this work is in the future applications and creating what we're calling meaningful communities of practice. So that means that all the tools we're developing, the resource collection, the map, the surveys and excavations can all be used to build new knowledge. And that knowledge can be passed down from generation to generation as other people are taking what we're developing as just tools and using them for other things. So the first goal, as I mentioned, is that Greenwood Centennial Resource Collection. The community needs we're uh, matching here is this understanding that Greenwood itself has gone through not only physical violence, but epistemological violence. Because now the archives itself are paying testimony to the, the scattering of people, the scattering of evidence. And now we're, it's our task to try and centralize that information into one place, but also make it more accessible because there's a real barrier of access here that, there, that is layered that we have to tackle. And, and also a problem of competing narratives and the fact that most of the books that have been published about Greenwood and about the Tulsa Race Massacre have been from non-local white sources. <clears throat> so just as our first kind of path at getting this resource collection together, we've already identified over 34 institutions that have collections related to Tulsa race massacre history. And a lot of those are outside of the state of Oklahoma and outside of the city of Tulsa. So again, this brings up a whole nother issue to access whenever you are, first of all, it's hard to know where to go to get information. And second of all, if you know where to go, if the manuscripts you're looking for, say at Yale University, that brings up a whole nother layer of uh, barriers to learning your own history, but also controlling the narrative for yourself. And second, that Greenwood Historical Web GIS, the community needs we're trying to meet with this project specifically is again that need to produce a centralized repository because we're going to embed this map with a lot of primary data that came from that resource collection, primarily maps and photographs. <clears throat> but then also add another layer of evidence to the trauma that has been already spoken in oral testimony, that's already been spoken in written testimony, but now we can actually look at the landscape as a witness to trauma. And one of the biggest issues in Greenwood is that the, the shifting footprint I mentioned, just trying to get the original boundaries of Greenwood is a hard, hard goal. So uh, trying to get the original boundaries and then focus on how that's shifting through time is a real big part of this and connecting both past and present day trauma. So uh, to do this, we separated Greenwood, the Greenwood mapping phase into four phases. Phase one, we're calling the rise of Greenwood. And this is uh, primarily we're working with a outside collaborator, Jessica Shelton. She's with the Habitat for Humanity, but she herself has taken on the, the challenge of trying to get a initial base map together for the original foundations of Greenwood. So starting from 1900 to 1920. So this will be our sort of base map to decide, uh, to, to discuss how initial families are coming into Greenwood because Black Wall Street wasn't built overnight. Individual families are coming in and establishing businesses and homes. And so trying to track those initial, that initial movement, that initial settlement, and then use that as a base map to build our other layers on top of and show change through time. So for phase two, we gave uh, 1921 its own, its own phase because there's so much happening simultaneously around the city. So this, the beautiful thing about this WebGIS map is that you can not only go in this diachronic space where you can focus on 100 years, but you can go at a micro level and talk about what's happening street by street in the city of Tulsa. And this is what creates these critical sites of memory. So we know that there's an initial uh, encounter that happens in the Drexel building and Sarah Page and Dick Rowland, we still may never know what actually happened in that elevator, but something happens. Sarah Page uh, claims that Dick Rowland actually assaulted her and the 
incendiary flames are kind of stoked from there. And then from that point, we know that Dick Rowland is arrested and is put in the top floor of the courthouse. And it's at about seven o'clock that evening that there's already hundreds, hundreds of white men, women, and children that are gathering around the courthouse to supposedly lynch uh, Dick Rowland. So at the same time, we've got reports coming in of uh, white people breaking into the armory to arm themselves for what they perceive as a battle coming up. So at the same time, you've got people in the northern part of the district in Greenwood that are hearing the rumors circulating that there's going to be a lynching tonight. We have to protect Dick Rowland. So they're coming to his aid. The mobs are breaking into factions and moving those crowds that are coming to defend him north. Uh, fighting breaks out. This is where the shooting is starting. And then First Street becomes the first battle line. And this is the battle line that is the last line of defense before Greenwood is attacked. But this is just what's going on downtown. If we go to the other side of this map, this is the northern district, and this is where actual Greenwood district sits. So there are, right as things are happening downtown, there's still people in the Dreamland Theater watching a movie. It's not until 10 o'clock at night that uh, Mr. Cotton, the manager, comes in, tells the people to turn the house lights on and everyone gets out. And then still, there's a whole other story at the Katy Railroad Station, as there was a train that ran from Oklahoma City to Muskogee, and there were a full train car of people stranded on this train from 10.45 p.m. to 6 a.m. the next day. They're stranded, hearing bombs, hearing gunshots, and they are helpless, they're stuck and we don't know anything about their story. So the idea of this map is not only to visualize what's happening in this landscape, but what stories are we missing? What's happening simultaneously? As we're looking across this 100 year span, what can we zoom in on as critical sites of memory now? And as we move into phase three, here's what we can focus on, again, not just what happened to the community, but how they survived, how they recovered, and so the phase three has the most sort of movement happening because people are living in internment camps to temporary housing, to rebuilding their homes and businesses. There's a lot of flight. But there's also a lot of efforts to rebuild and recover as people are actively fighting the legal system to be able to afford to rebuild and uh, get back on their feet. <clears throat> but this is also a phase where the, the Greenwood diaspora really starts. And in phase four, this is what we're calling the renewal and reimagining phase because this is where this, this urban renewal period is really impacting the land print of Greenwood uh, drastically yet again. So this is after this rebuilding phase. Now we're in a whole new phase where the footprint of Greenwood has now uh, shrunken over time yet again, but uh, now they've put a highway through it. And there's a ballpark sitting where houses used to be, as well as the OSU Tulsa campus. So there's a lot of things that are being shifted around and uh, roads are being shifted. And now the, the business district has actually been shrunken down to this little triangle I have circled here. So this is literally another visualization of how much Greenwood has changed, but most people only know about this present day iteration of Greenwood. So to give you an example of what this map could look like, here's a story map from the Historic Washington Project. And this was developed by a group known as CAST, the Center for Advanced Spatial Technologies out of the University of Arkansas. And they developed this project for the Historic Washington City. And they're covering uh, only a few years. We're, we're trying to cover 100. But this gives us a good idea of what a story map like this could look like. So they've got buildings in uh, purple shape files that are overlaid on top of a 1926 Sanborn map. And when you actually click on a structure, you can find out information about the, uh, the title of the building, its function, when it was built. But if you actually click on the Explore button here, you can find out more. Images, people associated with that structure, any events that happened here in this space. And what I love the most is that they give you this credit line. So, if you are interested in actually tracking down some photos, you know where to go. This one is actually pointing you to the Southwest Arkansas Regional Files. 
but uh, a lot a lot of this is just giving people breadcrumbs again to know where to go for more information. And so as we're moving into the archaeological phase of the project, the geophysical surveys and archaeological excavations, what we're trying to focus on here is the need to actually have another layer of evidence for violence and trauma on the landscape, but to also talk about the search for surviving structures, any foundations, any partial remnants of structures, any objects or anything that might be a part of this original story or part of what survived that urban renewal phase. And again, developing these new critical sites of memory is key, as well as tracing those original boundaries. So as we're thinking about critical sites of memory, there's an example. Uh, this is from a 1907 uh, Sanborn map. And the Stan uh, Standpipe Hill is one of those spaces where there's already been this narrative around this space as a site of violence because Oral testimony suggests that the National Guard actually perched machine guns on top of Standby Hill and were shooting rounds into Mount Zion Baptist Church and shooting people as they were running from their houses. And that can be a site of violence that's documented. Well, we can also talk about the other side of Standby Hill for its educational legacy. Because if you look at the base of this hill, and this uh, image in the center is showing you the base of Standby Hill. This Tul the Tulsa Ward School is right at the base of the hill. And this was the first school in the Greenwood District pre-statehood. So Oklahoma becomes a state in 1907. But even before uh, statehood, this school was there. And this school was run by the Creek Nation. So we have Creek, uh, Creek freedmen and Black children all going to this Tulsa Ward School together before segregation, before statehood. So now this can give us evidence that's leaning towards this uh, testimony of Creek Friedman and uh, both a Black and Creek legacy and heritage can be talked about for this one space. But it's only if we expand our, our uh, critical side of memory outside of just a side of violence and talk about both educational legacy and the, the violence that occurred here. And similarly, if you look at Sanborn maps, for uh, the, what's labeled the Negro District on the map. We have grand hotels like the Tremont Hotel here, but next door to Negro shanties. So these are mainly shotgun houses that are situated around the city in specifically in the northern part that talks about the, the differences in terms of socioeconomic status of people here. As I mentioned, not everyone was wealthy, but everyone had the opportunity. And then uh, the the, all, the other sort of narrative in Greenwood is that there's a lot of churches and schools and uh, sort of lofty businesses. But the other side of that is that there's a lot of gathering that's happening around pool halls, juke joints, and other spaces that are recreational. But all of these are part of Greenwood and all of these are gathering spaces that we could highlight. So as we're moving into the survey plan, we have a number of areas that we're interested in, but these are all just proposed areas. We, uh, we're still working through, again, trying to shift this plan based on time, accessibility, and permission from landowners. So all this is subject to change, but these are the areas we're interested in. And the first area we've got uh, as the E.W. Woods Memorial Land, and this has the, the le le least amount of modern disturbance and is really in a space where it's right above this sort of brick manufacturing facility and if you look at the 1915 uh, Sanborn maps. But this is also one of those spaces where we have exposed surface scatter. So there's a lot of active community collection happening right now that we're trying to uh, salvage with this interest here. So that's why it's kind of top on our list. And it's also a northern boundary point for us to work with as we're trying to redraw the, uh, the boundaries of the district, trying to get a handle on what's gonna be our northern boundary. This is a, a good uh, space for us to marcate the, the business district from the rest of the residential district. And then going back to Standpipe Hill, that's our area too. So actually uh, drawing our survey out to capture what was the Tulsa Ward School as a Western boundary for us is really important. And then on the other side, an eastern boundary that we're trying to work with is 
North Greenwood itself and North Hartford, because these two streets back to back are where a majority of community gathering is actually happening. So Vernon AME is situated on North Greenwood and is still there today and is one of the few standing structures that we know about from 1921. And there are two schools right behind it if you look at the Sanborn map to the left here, to the right here. So there's a small school that's labeled a Negro public school. And all we know about this, that was, it was established in 1908. We don't have a name for the school or any demographic information. But then the, the top school that's uh, a two-story frame structure is what we possibly think is the Dunbar grade school that was established in 1913. So right behind this uh, church gathering space, you've got two Negro public schools that we still need to know more about their story and more about how this community is working together uh, in addition to the businesses. So speaking of the businesses, our last survey area of interest is what's known as Deep Greenwood. So in that uh, map that I showed you before, where it's just a little triangle of space, this is the block that's left behind, where we have uh, a lot of businesses that are still there on Greenwood Street, on Greenwood Avenue, but a lot of it has been overrun by development and gentrification, modern day encroachment, because you can see the highway going right above it, and you can see a lot of disturbance going on around it, and the, the ballpark is off to the left. So we're trying to get a space right where the uh, parking lot is over there. So as we're redrawing the district, you can think about what it looks like today in terms of this one square block, or triangle block really, uh, that the boundaries are focused on for the business district versus going back to 1911 and counting more than 40 square blocks that are part of this business district at the time and how much both the mass uh, the massacre, but also gentrification and uh, modern day development has eaten away at this district over time. But we can, with a map, turn back the clock and talk about what, what's the connection between now and then. So in our last uh, iteration of this, our goal here is to think about the future, those visionary needs for this project. And so for the community, one of the most important enduring needs is that there's a lack of justice for the victims of the massacre, even a hundred years later. So, and there's little legal protection for the district itself as a physical space. And also needing to put more uh, educational resources, especially at the college level, and what we can do about promoting more scholarship from local Black authors. So, uh, as we're thinking about this, there are a number of people, a number of groups, who are already taking what we're developing with this map, with our uh, surveys, with the resource plan, to take what we're doing and use, the, use it as tools for completely separate projects. So one of those separate projects is a legal case for reparation that's just been filed. Uh, and you can go to justiceforgreenwood.org to find out more about that. And <clears throat> this is uh, a new case on behalf of uh, descendant families in Greenwood. And then there's another group that's out of New Orleans that's trying to put together a new nomination for a national registry for the entire district. And at the same time, street names are being changed. You can see in the photo on the right here, they just renamed uh, what was Brady Street that was named after Tate Brady, a known KKK member, uh, to name it, <laughs> to rename it Reconciliation Way. And that now we have more historical markers that are being put in place above ground. And why that's important is because there were a number of uh, placards that were actually in the ground that were constantly being ripped up in Greenwood. And, but for Parker and I, our main goal for the future for this project is through education. And so we're putting out new education initiatives. The Tulsa syllabus is one of those that are uh, co-created by myself and Carla Slocum. You can go to that website there and share more about what uh, Black Wall Street was and is but also the, her the, link, the a legacy of Black heritage in Oklahoma. And that's kind of a precursor to a class I'm gonna be teaching in the fall, the archeology span of Black heritage in Oklahoma. But we're also interested in doing web, uh, workshops to actually teach more students how to use this map interface in the classroom, especially in North Tulsa. And whatever comes out of our excavations, if, there, if we get any artifacts at all, whatever is revealed, we want to stay in Greenwood. So focusing on those new exhibition opportunities 
is really key. And thankfully, with the run-up to the centennial, there's a number of projects that are already working to develop exhibit spaces. So we have a lot of options to exhibit material in Greenwood. And last thing I wanted to share is that we have a number of local Black authors that you could uh, point to if you want to know more about Greenwood history or Black heritage in Oklahoma. So I'm putting up a few here for you to dive into. And I wanted to thank our institutional partners, especially our main supporter, the Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission, and our two institutions, the University of Tulsa and Brown University, as well as a number of other uh, folks and institutions who have helped us develop this project and continue to help us with getting access to material. And if you are interested, there are a few references that I wanted to point out. We've got two articles that are actually in progress right now that are going to be coming out soon. Uh, as uh, things that are actually highlighting the work we're doing right now. So it's unfolding and we're writing as we're doing this. So thank you very much. I think it's time for questions. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Odewale. Thank you, Dr. Flesher. Hello, everyone. I am Daniel Dominguez, Associate Professor of African History at Rice, and I will be moderating a Q&A session. If you have a question, please send it to us by using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we already have some questions here uh, lining up. Uh, one curious question, if you may, why was Greenwood a safe haven or was it a safe haven at all? Yeah, that's a really good question. It was a safe haven because uh, this, is, this is still Oklahoma. <laughs> so uh, there's actually a number of all black towns in Oklahoma and Oklahoma had the largest number of all black towns in the country. So Tulsa is one of those cases where it, it almost was an all black town because there was so much being developed around Greenwood. But um, due to other circumstances, it, it wasn't. But uh, this is one of those little pockets of oasis where people could draw to own land, to own businesses, to do things that they couldn't do in other spaces. So that's what made it a, a safe haven before the massacre happened, of course. And uh, regarding still pre-1921, has there been any oral history documentation of life in Greenwood before 1921? Oh yes, quite a bit. Uh, if you go to the John Holt Franklin Center for Reconciliation, their website, they have a whole uh, curriculum resource guide that has a number of recorded oral testimonies. And as well as the Oklahoma History uh, Center has a number of oral testimonies as well. Uh, there, there's quite a few out there, but they are, some are recorded as survivors and some are recorded as descendants of survivors. So it kind of depends, but there's a lot of oral testimony. And one of the books that I highlighted by Eddie Faye Gates is one of those scholars who made it her mission to record as many testimonies as she could before survivors passed away. And then she made it her mission to go to as many survivors' funerals as she could. So we have a lot of obituaries just from her work. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> a question from uh, Sonia Beach. You mentioned you are Tolson, as I am, and we received very little education about Greenwood and the massacre. What was one of the most surprising or shocking things you've learned during your research about the district or the event itself? I think one of the most shocking things I learned was the amount of denial that still exists right now in 2020. Uh, even with, you know, TV shows like Watchmen, I mean, there, there are people that are just now learning about this, and there are people who are still denying that it happened or it wasn't real or uh, trying to downplay it as not that bad. And so we are just in a space where we need all of the evidence we can just to support the oral testimony that's already been out there for decades. But uh, 
there's still a lot more work we have to do to put it in schools. So that's that's why for our project, we really want it to be centered around education because that's where real change can happen. Thank you. Uh, Susan Ryan asks, it seems there is an overlap between indigenous archaeology and auto archaeology. Can you Absolutely. speak to some of the differences and similarities, please? I actually don't know if I could speak to the differences uh, because a lot of the, the few people that are doing auto archaeology right now, they're both descendants and archaeologists. And indigenous archaeologists that are coming into this space now are have been doing that sort of descendant labor for a number of years. And so other folks are kind of taking that same model and applying it in other places, such as Tulsa. But uh, there, there are other people that I'm thinking of, uh, Rachel Ingman, who's, who's the person that I cited on that slide. She's actually a descendant of um, Afro-Danish peoples. And so she's working in a slave castle in Ghana as a descendant of uh, an officer there and excavating that space as a descendant, but also as someone trained in uh, historical archaeology. So that's, that's one of those ways that this is lending itself to other cases of descendancy and indigenous, arch indigenous scholars have been doing that forever. Uh, Professor Molly Morgan uh, asking on behalf of a student in her class. You mentioned when discussing phase three that people were living in internment camps. Can you speak more on what you mean by this? So right after the, uh, the last round of houses are being looted and burned, uh, people are being captured and marched to specific holding cells or specific imprisonment centers. One was the Civic Center, another was the uh, McNulty Ballpark, several spaces around the city were basically turned into prisons. From that, once martial law ends in the city, then people are um, given what's called vouchers to have a voucher for meals, have a voucher for showers, have a voucher for a lot of just essential living. And part of that was putting them in tents and turning this into internment camps. There were massive amounts of tents just set up around this sort of imprisonment space. And that's what makes it, that's what a lot of people have referred to as internment camps, but also why a lot of people have spoken about this as a attempted genocide. Wow, wow. thank you. Uh, from another student, uh, you mentioned downplaying of terrible historical events. How has the school system failed in teaching these events and how can this be remediated or remedied? That's a really good question. Uh, how has the school system failed? Well, um, we have to acknowledge that there was a there was a culture of silence for a long time in Tulsa. From uh, white Tulsans, it could be, you know, out of guilt and shame, but for black Tulsans, it's out of safety. Because again, they were still in Jim Crow South at the time. So not talking about what happened was a, uh, a coping mechanism for survival. Because mm -hmm. People were still actively being lynched, people were actively being beaten, and people were walking around <laughs> wearing the fur mm. coats that they have stolen out of people's houses, and you're wow. expecting not to say anything. So thinking about how education could have failed us, we have to first acknowledge that people weren't talking about this, not just in the schools, they weren't talking about it in homes and in, in the streets. And then once it came to actually talking about this in a school system, they saw that as not their problem, especially mm -hmm. white Tulsans, especially South Tulsans that are not part of this sort of North Tulsa legacy. So we have to make it part of everyone's problem to talk about, to make sure that it is in all schools. But thankfully mm -hmm. we have a number of educational uh, initiatives that have been put forth. Hannibal Johnson is one of those key players that have put, put forth a curriculum in uh, Tulsa schools, and now it's actually required to be taught in public schools, K through 12, but not at the college level. So that's where I'm working my magic. All right, excellent. Well, we, we, we have a, a related question here, which I found interesting, uh, especially uh, because it connects with uh, the way you started your lecture, you know, by quoting that passage and uh, uh, referring that you were not going to display any image of you no know, body parts or anything. So the question is from uh, Kaylee Leeden. 
how do you ensure that trauma is not exacerbated for individuals? Ooh, that's good. Uh, part of that, um, th those models that I was giving for restorative justice archaeology, the need for it to be layered and community-based is that you are committed to doing no harm to past peoples as much as you're committed to not doing harm for present-day residents. So for me, what that means is that I'm committed to telling a more complete picture of what Greenwood was for, the, for past day residents, but I'm also committed to the fact that for North Tolsons today, their living, their li life expectancy is on average about seven years shorter than the rest of Tulsa. They're living in what's known as a food desert. So actu actual change needs to happen on the ground. And so that's why that layered perspective is so important because we need real resources in North Tulsa. We still need a grocery store. We still need more din dentist office or doctor's offices in North Tulsa um, just to increase that quality of life. And so trying to not, not just undo trauma, but to actually restore quality of life in this area is something that we're actively working towards, but we can't do it alone. So our, our project is doing one part, but we're partnering with several other groups, as I mentioned, to extend what we can do here. Yeah. Super. Uh, there are two questions here that are <clears throat> related, and I think uh, we can address both of them. Uh, one is asking, uh, would you say the dialogue and narratives you're gathering and documenting mostly come from descendants of survivors, or are you getting first-hand accounts from older people? And the other is, are there ways in which students and other Tulsa youth have been integrated in the research and information dissemination processes? Okay, let me answer the first one. Uh, we're not doing any new narrative collection because there's so much out there already. All we're doing is documenting where things are so people know it exists. We're trying to make it more accessible. Uh, the, the second question about student involvement, I actually have a graduate student who's working, uh, partnering with me on this project, but she has her own dissertation that's documenting uh, the archaeology of racial violence across the country. And so thinking, taking uh, Tulsa is just one case and documenting what other archaeology exists for these sites of racial violence is her main project. So she's part of this work. We have a number of students that have been partnering with us and some are just volunteers that just want to be part of this that have been uh, active in collecting data for us, that have been active in sort of um, setting up the ways in which we're framing this massive inventory list of collections and just trying to get a handle on where everything is. Again, 34 institutions. We didn't do that just by ourselves. It's just me and Parker. So <laughs> we have a lot of student <laughs> help. <laughs> Great. Uh, and uh, have community members raised research questions that surprise you in some way or were just unexpected? Uh, there, there was, there's been a lot more interest now in trying to document more of that Creek Freedman story. And so trying to see how, what archeology span can do to highlight that story is something that's new that we're thinking about. Uh, and so a lot of the map, the map collection that we're doing, we're also collecting just uh, allotment maps as well as the historical mm. images, as well as the geophysical and uh, the, uh, the topographic maps as well. So, I mean, all of this layered information is coming from what community members are interested in finding more about. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and the, the maps, uh, once they are made available, are they going to be interactive? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. But, okay. but interactive in a sense that once you have these historical maps uh, embedded into GIS, you can turn the layers uh, off and on uh, and, and you can focus on change through time or you can just zoom into one map. It's definitely something you can interact with. All right, terrific. Uh, Professor Alexander Bird asks, well, he first says, thank you for a wonderful presentation. And he's asking, could you please talk more about the various place names attached to the district and whether and how these place names expand or, or complicate your idea of Black Wall Street? The place names. So you remember like, like Brady Street? Is that what he's talking about? <laughs> I suppose so. Uh, so there are a number of streets that have been named in Tulsa after 
uh, this urban renewal phase. So that whole naming of Brady Street, that didn't happen until this urban renewal sort of beautifying cities thing plan came in. So a lot of the original names were just like Main Street, First Street, uh, Cincinnati. So they, they weren't really problematic until people started renaming streets to honor certain individuals. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, and there's also a lot of, uh, again, this is Oklahoma, so a lot of streets have uh, names that are more reminiscent of Creek heritage as well. Well, Nate, that's interesting. Uh, a couple of uh, questions here, uh, putting things into a comparative perspective, perhaps. Uh, how was this uh, event different from previous targetings of Black communities, such as Rosewood, if at all? So I'm not going to go into that, because that's, that's a whole mm. other research topic. <laughs> mm. And I've, I've been really <laughs> adamant in having Tulsa stand on its own mm. as a unique case. Uh, and if I really wanted to start comparing, we'd have to start with the 132 other sites of racial violence around the country at this time. Rosewood is one, but there's a number of them that are out there that could be compared to Tulsa in one way or another. But thankfully, um, one person that I didn't mention, uh, Edward Gonzalez Tennant, he came up with a research project for Rosewood specifically. So if you want to know more about Rosewood, he'd be a good person to uh, follow up on. But his project is visualizing it in a different way for virtual reality. Mm -hmm. And uh maybe along the same lines, what are some nascent sites for restorative justice archaeology in the U.S.? What are some, what are some sites for restorative justice archaeology yeah. in the U.S.? Yeah. Uh, emerging sites. Oh, emerging sites. Well, this is one, uh, yes, but if you go definitely. back to, <laughs> if you go back to uh, Chip Colwell's original study out of uh, Fort Apache, I mean, he's a prolific researcher and writer for the Southwest, so the South, this tradition is really coming out of indigenous archaeology and Southwest archaeology. So this is the first time that I'm aware of it being applied in a African diaspora archaeology context. Great, thank you. Uh, before we finish, Brenda Alpo just wants to come, uh, confirm with you. Hey, Brenda. Did, yes. <laughs> Did I understand that there is work being done to achieve historical designation for the Greenwood District? Wait, say that again? Uh, she wants to know if there is work being done to achieve historical designation for the Greenwood District. Yes, yes, Brenda, there is. Uh, Fallon Adu, she's out of uh, New Orleans University, University of New Orleans, and uh, she's the one that's trying to spearhead the new nomination going forward for uh, the Greenwood District uh, as a district. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Professor Alicia Odewale, is Assistant Professor of Anthropology at the University of Tulsa. Uh, we also appreciate uh, Dr. Jeffrey Lesher, Pleasure for the introduction. Uh, tomorrow at 4 p.m. Central Time, Professor Jacqueline Cudi will lead a discussion titled Which Lives Matter? Race and Policing in France and Beyond. Please check our website for details. Next in our lecture series, uh, Eduardo Bonilla Silva will take, uh, will talk about what makes systemic racism systemic that will happen on October 21st at 6 p.m. Central Time. Please register at our website, cast.rice.eu slash events. Uh, if you missed previous lectures and if you wanna watch uh, Dr. Odewal again, please check our events, uh, event videos page on CAS website, cas.rice.edu slash event-videos. Uh, I would like to thank again our co-sponsors, the Task Force for Slavery, Segregation, Racial Justice, and Bridge, Buildings Research on Inequality and Diversity to Grow Equity. Thank you very much also for our staff who are working behind the scenes, uh, Tara Woosley, Andrew Staple, and John Waterhouse. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight. I wish you all a very nice evening. See you on the October 21st. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. <laughs>